are continuing on with our series, uh, looking at the Holy Spirit. Um, we started this a few weeks ago, looking at just who the Holy Spirit is. And I entitled my opening sermon, Meet the Holy Spirit. We spent a little bit of time just getting to know who the Holy Spirit is. Um, and I, I started there because, as I said then, uh, we have this, uh, I have this, and I, I think many people share it, a, a, from a human perspective, we'll never understand God, but I have a better understanding of who God the Father is. And I have a pretty good understanding, humanly, as, a, as much as human cap- is capable of, of understanding God the Son, Jesus. But God the Holy Spirit just seems kind of vague, kind of distant. And um, I can't help but think, in part, it's because we know how to refer to God the Father. He's our Father. We just saw a video that talked about Brian and Bethany bringing into their family kids, adopting them into their family. They relate through those familial terms. God the Father. When I Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he said, pray like this, our Father in heaven. We talk to our Father. The second person in the Trinity, God the Son, we have a name that, that he had here on earth, Jesus. It was his earthly name. We see him have uh, take on a lot of names, a lot of, uh, of titles. And so we can talk about, and we pray to, Jesus. We talk about Jesus all the time. We can relate to him. But God, the Holy Spirit, like, wouldn't it be great? I, I heard a, a pastor talking. He said, if only we had a name, like God the Father, Jesus, a name. And he gave, in his example, he gave the Holy Spirit the name Chuck. And then we just talked to Chuck. And then, but then he backed off and he said something that I found very interesting. He said, we don't really have, we see a lot of names of God, but typically we don't talk, we don't use those names when we, when we speak to God. I mean, sometimes we do. Um, but a lot of times we just address him as, Father. And it's a title. Jesus is Jesus' name, but a lot of times we talk about God the Son. We talk about Christ. Christ means anointed one. It's a title. We talk about Savior. It's a title. Holy Spirit is a title. And it occurred to me that when, when I did my first sermon, uh, Meet the Holy Spirit, We actually did have those same types of things in that. Uh, As we looked at, primarily we started in John chapter 14, verse 16, where Jesus says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. And we looked at the word, the Greek word parakletos, um, which means uh, to come alongside of, and said various translations when we look at that verse. Sometimes it's translated advocate, helper, counselor, comforter. Those are all words that we use when we talk about the Holy Spirit, and sometimes we use them as addressing him. We talk about our, the Holy Spirit, our comforter. And so while it's not a name, it gives us a better description, a better understanding of who he is. One of the things I think we need to recognize, though, is part of the problem we have is because we don't think of him as a person. Because we don't have an actual name to call him, Chuck, we don't have, we don't have that, that image. He doesn't have a body like Jesus. He doesn't have a name like Jesus. And so we don't think of him in those terms as being personal. I did mention a couple weeks ago that he isn't this nebulous concept, this, he isn't just a force, he is a person. And I want to look a little bit more at that today. The person of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, we read about uh, some happenings in the, in the first century church, and it says this, it says, while they, followers of Jesus, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work 
to which I have called them. There's interaction with the person of the Holy Spirit. And I think one of the things we can see here that we recognize as as having the characteristics of a person is that the Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit has a will. He has a desire. He is working out his will in believers' lives. He says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. I have a desire to use them in ministry. It's my goal to see them do a specific work. And so the Holy Spirit calls into ministry Saul and Barnabas, or actually Paul as we know him, and Barnabas, because he's exercising his will. We see this again um, in in a slightly different way, and I think we need to spend a little bit of time looking at this too. Acts chapter 16, I want to read verses 6 through 10. It says this in Acts chapter 16. Paul, now being referred to as Paul, not Saul, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they pressed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. The Holy Spirit made clear to Paul that he wanted him to go and preach the gospel in Macedonia. Again, the Holy Spirit has a a desire to see God's will carried out. The Holy Spirit's will is the will of the Father. But did you notice that the Holy Spirit also willed for Paul not to do things? Paul had a plan. Paul had a desire. Hey, I got an idea. Let's go to Phrygia. Let's go to Galatia. Holy Spirit said, it's not what I want. It's not what I planned for you. The Holy Spirit knew what he wanted to have happen. He has a will. And it sounds like he exerted his will. It sounds like he forced his will on Paul. He says, they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the, God, the, the word in the province of Asia. Asia. They tried to enter Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit, of the, uh, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. I want you to understand something. The Holy Spirit has a will. He has a desire. But he does not force his will or his desire. I believe, as Luke writes these verses here, he is exercising, um, he's putting into words, what he sees Paul living out in his life. Paul's desire was to follow the will of the Holy Spirit. Paul's desire was to obey what the Holy Spirit had for him. And so he would not go against it. His desire was always to do what the Holy Spirit called him to. His desire was to always leave behind anything that the Holy Spirit didn't call him to. And so the Holy Spirit as he made his, his will known to Paul, Paul saw it as absolute. I can't do that. The Holy Spirit doesn't will that for me. That's not in the Holy Spirit's desire for me. The Holy Spirit related to Paul in such a way as Paul knew, he perceived, he sensed what the Holy Spirit wanted from him. The Holy Spirit made his will plain to Paul, and Paul simply acted on that will. Paul's desire was to see the will of the Holy Spirit, and by extension, the will of God, carried out. He listened carefully for that. He wanted the Holy Spirit's will revealed in his life so that he knew what to do. And the Holy Spirit was pleased to do that. 
The Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit also has a mind. Uh, Again, back in John chapter 16, uh, starting in verse 12 and reading just 12 in the first part of verse 13, Jesus again speaking says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. First thing, again, that I want to point out here is, is the pronoun, he. The Holy Spirit is referred to not as it, but as he. That, that person of the Holy Spirit. Not an inanimate object, not a nebulous force, but having personality. A person. But it also says that he will guide us into truth. He will reveal what is true. There's, there's a knowledge, there's more than knowledge, uh, wisdom that the Holy Spirit possesses and that he desires to impart to us from the mind of God to the mind of the believer through the Holy Spirit revealing the mind of God. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 8. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So you see those two things kind of working together. The will of God comes to us through the mind of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals to us in a logical, informed way through his mind. We talk about animals, and a lot of times we give animals um, human characteristics. My dog, I have a dog, a black lab named Lucy. She has a brain. It is a functioning physical organ. I'd like to think that Lucy has a mind, the ability to think, the ability to reason. Uh, as a matter of fact, I like to uh, figure out what she's thinking. I'll look at her sometimes and I'll think, I wonder what, if only Lucy and I could talk. I'd love to know what's going on in her mind. But the reality is, I don't know that animals actually have minds. Because a mind is the processing of information in a logical, rational, reasonable way. Dogs just do things. There, uh, perhaps you're familiar with uh, the experiments that Pavlov did with Pavlov's dog, programmed response. I have a very well-behaved dog, but that well-behaved dog is the, the result of a lot of Pavlovian-type training. Rewards, discipline, rewards, discipline, so that Lucy has learned behavior. I say learned, and even that I'm not sure is right, because that kind of gets back to the whole mind thing. Humans are different than animals. We have the ability to reason. We have rational thought. We make decisions based on all of the information that we bring in. We have been made in the image of God. I believe that that is a characteristic that God has. And I think that's what Paul is saying here as he ties will and mind together in that verse. He who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Who searches your heart? God the Father. He searches our heart. He knows the mind of the Spirit. And the Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with the will of God. So because the Holy Spirit has a will and he has a mind and he interacts with God, the Father, in those areas, and he lives in me, I have the ability through the Holy Spirit to have those interactions with God the Father. He has made humanity in his image to have that ability, to have that rationality, to have the ability to think critically, to make decisions, to rational, for rational thinking, not just for programmed response. We're different than the rest, of, uh, the rest of the animal kingdom because we're made in the image of God, in the image of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He has a will and he has a mind. 
And his desire is for us to know that mind. The Holy Spirit also has emotions. We have the ability to have the Holy Spirit at work in us. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in us, uh, Paul says that what he does is he develops what we refer to as the fruit of the Spirit. Actually, Paul calls it the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is, as he lists it out in uh, Galatians chapter 5, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then Paul says, against such things there is no law. They're good. They're wholesome. And while they're not always looked at, and certainly some of them aren't ever, emotions, I think there, there is an emotional component to them. Joy isn't just an emotion, but it does have emotional expression. Love isn't just an emotion, but it has emotional expression. Kindness has an emotional expression. If, if the Holy Spirit were devoid of emotion, we wouldn't have the same type of emotional responses. But he, he, that's part of how he relates to us, how he reveals himself to us. But not only does he have positive emotions, there are all kinds of emotions. And again, as in Paul's writings, in Ephesians chapter 4, I want to start in verse 25 and, and read through uh, 25 through 32. Paul writes this. He says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for, for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now listen, listen to verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, anger, and rage, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, just as in Christ God forgave you. In that list, most of the negative things that, that Paul lists, certainly, again, not all of them, but most of them deal with our emotions. He, says, he talks about not sinning in our anger. He talks about, um, he talks about, uh, about being helpful and building others up in what we say, being encouraging. He talks about getting rid of bitterness, rage, anger, every form of malice. But in the midst of all of that, he says, if you don't, what you'll do is grieve the Holy Spirit. The word grieve, a lot of times, if we use it in, in other forms, we talk about mourning, sadness, grief. Too often, I read this verse, and I think grieve the Holy Spirit is an, act of, an active thing that we do. But there's an emotion tied to that. I believe it hurts the Holy Spirit's heart. I believe he mourns. He doesn't, he's not disappointed in me, but he's, he's saddened by choices that I make. And what's interesting in there is most of what saddens him, according to this list, is how I treat other people. My emotions toward other people. I have the ability to cause grief to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't force his will on anyone. He invites us to bring his will, bring our will in compliance with his. He doesn't force his mind on us. He doesn't force his emotion on us. But he does desire us to connect with him on all of those levels because he is a person and he wants to relate to us the way a Holy Spirit or a way a person relates to another person. 
No, the Holy Spirit isn't human, but he is a person. Humanity, all of humanity, has as a component personhood. Humans are people. The Holy Spirit is also a personality, a person. He has personality, and he wants us to relate to him. Another thing that persons do is just that. They relate to each other. The Holy Spirit speaks to us and through us. He speaks to the believer. In Acts chapter 8, we see the Holy Spirit, um, just as the Holy Spirit was giving direction to the church about setting Saul and Barnabas aside for specific work, just like he told Paul and revealed to Paul what he wanted him to do, the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 8 has a conversation with Philip. Verse 29, it says, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Philip sees a chariot, notices that there's a guy in it who is uh, having scripture actually read to him. And the Holy Spirit says, do you know what I want you to do? I want you to go over and get into this situation. I, I would like you over here. He tells him, because his desire is to work in the life of Philip. So he talks to Philip. But he also used Philip and, and worked through him. And just so you think, I, you know, a lot of times we spend, I like to spend time in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And it's a little difficult at times to talk about the Holy Spirit and go to the Old Testament because his working in the, Holy, in the Old Testament understandably was different because Jesus hadn't sent him to live in us. But even in the, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was at work. And in 2 Samuel, uh, verse, or 2 Samuel chapter 23, we see David telling about what the Holy, the Holy Spirit's work in his life. In 2 Samuel 23, it says, these are the last words of David, the inspired utterance of David, the son of Jesse. The utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. Then listen to what David says in verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word is on my tongue. God speaks to us through His Holy Spirit. God speaks through us through the Holy Spirit. One of the Holy Spirit's roles is to speak to us so that he can use us and speak through us to others. It's relationship. It's relational. He is a personal, relational being. Not just a force. Not simply a, a spirit but he is the Spirit of God with all the characteristics of God. He is a divine person, not a human person, but a person nonetheless. He has all the qualities and characteristics of God the Father. We relate to God the Father. He has all the characteristics and, and divine attributes of God the Son. He is God. He is a person. Again, Jesus said, I'll ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Another. The Holy Spirit, sometimes we refer to him as the Spirit of God. Sometimes we refer to him as the Spirit of Christ. Because while we will never understand the Trinity, we recognize the reality of it and we embrace all parts of it. The Holy Spirit is no less God than God the Father. And he's no less person than God the Son. He doesn't have a body, but he is a person. And again, Jesus' words in John chapter 16, starting in verse 13, he says, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in, in all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you, what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is, it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. 
All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are working in, in unison, in tandem, bringing to us all that they have for us. When we spend time relating to one or two, but not all three, we're missing out on an opportunity to get to know God better. We must be in relationship with God. And that includes God the Spirit. Now, we don't typically talk about praying to Holy Spirit. Jesus gave as an example, is his, his model for praying, addressing God the Father. Jesus, in his teaching, said, anything you ask in my name, I will grant. And so, typically when we pray, we address God, the Father, Heavenly Father, and we start our prayers, Heavenly Father, and then we go on speaking. When we get to the end of it, we say, in Jesus' name, amen. But we are told plainly that the Holy Spirit prays for us. And we are told nowhere in Scripture that we should not speak to the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit prays for me, doesn't it make sense that I would interact with him? He knows my mind. He knows my thoughts. He dwells in me. Why not have a relationship, a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit? I would encourage you to stretch yourself a little bit and recognize that the Holy Spirit isn't someone close to you. The Holy Spirit is someone who is in you, and you can and should and need to strengthen and grow that relationship. One prayer that I think is very appropriate is asking the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about seeking gifts. Ask the Holy Spirit to enable you, empower you, reveal to you what he wants to do in your life. Ask him to work in you, ask him to work through you. We have this idea that the Holy Spirit is somehow a little more distant than God the Father and God the Son. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Holy Spirit is very close. Christ lives in me through His Spirit. God works in me through His Spirit. The Spirit is who's doing the work in me. Last week we talked about this, we, we looked at the Spirit is life and saw from creation through salvation, through the completion of all of all of history, the Holy Spirit is involved in all of life. He wants that to be personal in our lives. He wants us to relate to Him. Will you allow the Holy Spirit to reveal His will, to perform His will, to reveal His mind, to transform your mind into alignment with His, to allow His emotions to be your emotions? to speak to you and through you? Will you relate to the Holy Spirit as a person? Heavenly Father, it is easier to talk to you because it's what we're accustomed to. And it is what Jesus taught. But Lord Jesus, you told us that you would reveal yourself in a new way, that you would send your Spirit to live in us, to guide us, to direct us. Holy Spirit, we recognize that you do a work in us. And that is a, a part of your role as God to transform us by the renewing of our mind, by giving us insight into your mind, drawing us closer to the mind of Christ, shaping us, molding us, conforming us, 
so that we can perform our reasonable will of service. That is, that is our reasonable act of service, our will. So Lord, we ask that you would be at work in us. Holy Spirit, come. Have your way in us. Do your work in us. Reveal yourself to us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me, on us, on your church. Send us out in your power to do your will for your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed. Now go be the church.